Um, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Yeah, I'm going to miss Brother Rains for sure. You know, he came, I guess, just right before our family came to this church. And um, he's been here the whole time to me. He's a fixture to me. And it's not going to be the same without him for sure. Yeah. Brother Rains was a unique and special guy with a lot of wisdom too. You know, I find myself, if I listen to him, and he would say some funny, you know, things and some silly things too. But if I listen to him, I really find that he, the reason, if I think about why is he saying this, he had a lot of wisdom. Brother Rains had a lot to teach. So it's sad, but I believe he's with the Lord. Amen for that. Amen. And you know what? We're here to be a blessing to his wife. So First Samuel chapter 9, I want to preach a message called Thou Hast Done Foolishly. And we're going to do a bunch of reading, and I really don't have a ton of comments, I don't think. Um, but that'll be okay. That'll probably be better than usual. So before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people, Lord, that are here today. Thank you for bringing us here, Lord. You brought us all here safely. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that you bless this time, Lord. Use it to your ends, whatever it is, Lord, in each of our lives and hearts. And I pray that you'd use it the way you want, Lord. I pray that you'd bless it. I pray that you'd be with be with Brother Rains' family. Boy, Lord, be with Mrs. Rains. God, I pray that you'd bless them. Be with them, Lord. They're just on our heart and mind this morning, Lord. Of course, be with Brother Don and Miss Donna. God, and there's others in our church, too, and, and others even outside our church that are close to us that, that we're all thinking of and we care about, Lord. And I pray that you'd bless them and answer their prayers and raise them up, Lord. And I pray that you'd be glorified in it, too, Lord. I pray that you bless this time, bless this message, bless the message to come, bless everything we do today, Lord. Help it all to be done for your honor and glory. And I pray that you'd use it. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 9. I want to read, I called the message, Thou hast done foolishly. I don't think this is on. That's okay with me if it's okay with you, but that's, is it this thing? Yep, it is. There we go. Okay. It'll come on. Okay. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Let's start in verse 1. We're not going to read the whole chapter. We're going to read a good portion of it, and I'll make a few comments, and then we're going to go on and read some more. So, thou hast done foolishly, and I'll just tell you, I almost called the message, I forced myself. I forced myself. And if you... If you know where I'm going, you know where I'm going now. But let's talk about this a little bit. First Samuel chapter 9, let's read in verse 1. And I'm going to read kind of sort of fast. I don't want to lose you, but I want to get through it. So, now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of... And by the way, I'm just going to read these names like I know them. I don't know if I'm saying these right. That's the way I do it. So let's just do it. Now there was a man of Benjamin, I got that one right, whose name was Kish, the son of Abil, the, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, and passed through the lands of Shalassah, Shalassah, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and there they were not. And he passed through the land of, ben of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses, and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is, a, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure, sorry, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver, that I will get that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. Verse 11, And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. And he said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered them, and said, He is, behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city. 
For there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. It's interesting. As soon as you come into the city, you shall straightway find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice. And afterwards they eat, they be bidden. And now therefore get you up, for about this time you shall find him. And they went up into the city, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them, for, go, for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Saul, Samuel saw Saul, the Lord, say that ten times fast, and when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of. This same, and I'm not preaching this, and so I want to put it in your idea, in your head, really, because maybe I'll preach it someday, but I can't right now. But this reminds me of John. And behold, here's the man and, and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Anyway, just a, a parenthetical statement. Then, and it says, When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, this is verse 17, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place. For you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, and of which I said unto thee, Set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder. And that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, up that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down the end, to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou a while, that I may show thee the word of God. So I'm going to stop there. And our next we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. But I want to make a couple of points. And this is not, I'm just driving at the ultimate point. But I want to make a couple of points. For one, high places. We see high places here. One, two, three, four, five times it references the high place in this chapter. Now, Samuel's a great man of God. You know, Samuel is very much, you know, right. And he's doing right. And he's following the Lord. But there are high places in the city. And so... God never told his people to sacrifice at a high place. He never told them to worship at the high places. And so the high places are really like vestigial items left over from, you know, when they were not obeying the Lord, when they were worshiping, um, you know, and, and I mix it in my mind, they worship in the groves and the high places and they worship unto the unto the devils and stuff. So. The high place. There's a high place in the city. There's a high place still. But Samuel's a great man of God. So I just want to make the point. And again, I'm just driving at the ultimate point. But some battles are relevant in our time and in our place. There's no doubt. But some battles aren't. Some battles, and this is something Pastor Turk talked about with he read a book with um, J. Frank Norris. And some of the battles that he had to fight. And some of the battles that he's fighting are not battles that were... And I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know, maybe they're battles we've already surrendered as, as the church and as Christians. I don't know. I'm not preaching that either. But the point is, there are battles that are really relevant to some men in some day, in some time, in some place that are not to another man in another time and place. And there's some battles that are meant for you to fight and that God's going to put in your path and you've got to fight it. If you don't fight it, you're a coward. And then there are battles that you shouldn't go fight. They're not in your path. And if you do go fight it, even if you can identify which is the right side and you go swinging away, you've not been commissioned into the battle. And you really, you don't know the battle plan. You're not a part of that battle. And I'm, I'm probably going a little too far 
with this analogy for this message, but I want to make this point that there are some battles that you just don't need to fight. And then there are battles you got to fight. And if you don't, you're a coward, like I said. And so some battles may come to you that somebody else isn't fighting or that somebody else doesn't doesn't see a need to fight. And that's okay. But I want to make this point that there are still some high places here. And that's not right. But that's not something that God had Samuel tackle, apparently. I don't we don't see that anywhere. So. That's I'm not talking about Samuel, but I just want to make the point. There are still some high places in our lives, too, though. You know, I mean, there are still and I like to think that this church is just right on the money, just straight down the line. But I also know and I like to, by the way, I'm right about everything that I'll argue with you over all of it. But I was right last year when I changed my mind a bunch since then, too. So the point is, I think I'm right all the time. But you gotta you got to realize that we could be wrong. We could be corrected. I could have something wrong. And I want to think this church is just perfectly right. And But I know better than that. And I'm sure you do, too. The point is there are still some high places that do exist in, in our lives, in our church, in our, in our minds, in our worship, in our thinking. There are. 1 Kings chapter 3. Let's read a few of these verses. I'm building a point. I'm getting to it. Hopefully I can. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Now that was kind of a summary of... Now it's going to go back in time. Only the people sacrificed in high places. Because you see in verse 1, he's made all these things. But verse 2, only the people sacrificed in high places. Because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. So, we're going to stop here. We're going to read a few more out of this chapter. But we've got Solomon, who's, you know, he's trying to do right. We see that. It says, but he's, he's sacrificing in the high places. And it says he loved the Lord. And he walked in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt in the high places. But apparently God looked past this high place. And praise the Lord for that. Thank God for him looking past you know, high places in our lives. High places in my life. Thank God for that. So apparently God saw his heart. Despite the high place, God saw fit to reward him. Because he's, you know, it says he loved the Lord and he's walking in the statutes of David, his father, but he's just doing some things wrong. You know, he's not doing everything right. And it says that he went to this great high place. And even that is it's an abomination. It's wrong. But he's doing it with the right heart. He's doing it really because he loves the Lord. And apparently God sees something in his heart despite the high place. God sees something that he's going to answer. So let's read in verse six. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given to him a son to sit on his throne as it is to this day. As it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, in place of of my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself, Long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like unto thee, like un, like thee before thee. Neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have give also given thee that which thou. That which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that th- so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee in all thy days. And if 
Thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk. Then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. I've got a couple of notes, but it just makes me think, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. And here you've got Solomon. It's, it's, he's doing things wrong. He's doing things wrong, but he loves the Lord and he's trying to walk in the statutes of his, fa of his father, David. And he doesn't choose, you know, the things that would satisfy him. He wants to have this, the truth from God, the understanding and the wisdom, the wise and understanding heart. And so God just gives it all to him. Why did he want that? Because he committed his works unto the Lord, I believe. So let me say this. What you're given, you know, despite your shortcomings, it's for your heart. You know, if God gives you, just blesses you greatly, it's because he saw fit to do so. And if God gives you some kind of a trial, it doesn't mean punishment. If God gives you punishment, he saw fit to do so. And if God gives you a trial, it doesn't necessarily mean it's punishment, but he saw fit to do so. If God gives you the truth, he saw fit to do so. Where is he seeing fit? What's he looking at? He's looking at your heart. I believe that. If God allows you to remain in a lie, then he saw fit to do so. And I believe he looked at your heart. You notice in verse 15, Solomon did right after God gave him the truth. So I'll tell you this, doing right won't save you. But if you won't let God change what you're doing, if you won't let God change you, you won't be saved. So doing right won't save you. But if you won't allow God to direct you, allow God to change you, you're not being saved. You've not been saved. You won't be saved. It's simple as that. If you'll value these things in your heart, like Solomon did, that you know God wants, that are his priorities, the mind of the Lord, and you get it from the word. By the way, Solomon didn't keep doing right. But if you'll value these things of God, then he will bless you. He will. And it's, it's in your heart. It's not in your heart. It can't just say, I'm doing everything according to the rules. That's not it. All right. Do everything according to the rules. But that's not it. All right. It's, it's, it's your heart. It really is your heart. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. I've really not even got to the point I want to get to. 1 Samuel chapter 10, I'm going to begin reading. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain of his, over his inheritance? When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wantest to, wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses and sorroweth for you saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shalt meet thee, and there, where was I at? Thou shalt go forward to the plain of Tabor, and there shalt meet thee three men going up to God, to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, three little goats, not children, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine, and they will salute thee, and give thee... Two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place, with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are coming to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Let me say something. There's just enough slack here to hang yourself. That's what's been said about the Bible, and it's true. There was just enough slack in these instructions for Saul to hang himself. Let me say something else. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and thou shalt be turned into another man. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you're turned into another man. Simple as that. You're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. New man. Hey, if you don't like that, that's a big problem for you because that's what the Bible says. You've still got your old flesh. There's no doubt. But you've got a new desire and a new nature also. That one should rule and dominate. Certainly when you get saved at that moment, that new flesh or, the, or that new nature is dominating all right that new nature is is in control of your mind and heart when you get saved it won't be your whole life it won't always be in control of you but when you get saved you're a new creature 
boom, old things are passed away, they're gone. Will they be back? They'll be back, but they're gone. They're passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But it says, and let it be when these signs are coming to thee that thou do as occasion serve thee. He said, hey, the Lord's with you. You're turned into another man. Do as the occasion serve you. So if you tell a man with a right heart that wants to serve God, hey, do as the occasion serves you, not a problem. But if you tell a man with the wrong heart, with guile in his heart, we've talked about that, that wants to, that wants to not necessarily serve the Lord, but you know, maybe he does and maybe he doesn't, sin lieth at the door. All right, you're, you're real close. And this is what happens. What's next? Let's just go on reading. Look at the next, next verse. It's instruction. That's what's next. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down to thee to offer, I will come down to thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. So he says, I'll come down, I'll offer sacrifices, wait seven days. Then I will tell you what to do. It says in verse 9, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. Again, it's going to take another heart to serve God. It's, you, 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 you're not going to serve God with your old stony heart. All right. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he prophesied among them. And it came to pass. When all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come upon this unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high places, still got high places. And Saul's uncle said to, unto him and to his servant, now remember, Saul has been said, Samuel said, the Lord is with you. Just go, just follow the Lord and do what you think is right. Just, just do what you think is, is convenient. What did he say? Do as occasion serve thee. But, you know, according to the will of the Lord. And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. Verse 14, and Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, whither went she? And he said, to seek the asses. And when he saw that they were nowhere, he, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel told, said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, he told us plainly that the asses were found. But of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Saul, Samuel spoke, he told him not. Why did he tell him not? You know, I don't know. I don't have a whole lot of commentary on that, except to say that the spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. And I feel like Samuel was being, or not Samuel, Saul, these S names, I get them mixed up. If I've been mixing them up, forgive me, I may have. I feel like Saul was not being honest when he didn't tell the whole story. And by the way, withholding the truth is dishonesty. I want everybody to know that, specifically my children, but I want everybody to know that. But check this out real quick. You don't have to turn here, but 1 Corinthians 14, 32, I just quoted this verse. And the spirit of the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. We'll look at the next verse. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So we're talking about being in your place. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So, so do you think you have some authority? Did the, did the word of God come to you only? And he's saying, if anybody thinks of himself to be a prophet or spiritual, or if you fancy yourself a preacher of some sort, then you need to acknowledge that your authority and your only authority is the word of God. That's it. All right. You didn't, the word didn't come from you. It didn't come to you only. You don't have something to teach us that we couldn't have got from the word of God. And we'll talk about it. I want to learn from you. But you don't have some corner on the market. And you don't have some authority. And again, we're talking about, you know, the women speaking to the churches. We're talking about being in your place. And it started off with the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. But God's not the author of confusion. And he's the author of peace. And he's the author of order. And he's the author of, he's commanded obedience, it says. And he wants you in your place. And it talks about being a prophet or being, you know, somebody that's going to speak for the Lord. And it says you don't have some special knowledge. You got the Word of God, and that's all you got. You go beyond that, you're stepping into something you don't need to be tiptoeing into. So, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. I'm just going on. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So decently and in order. Uh, where's the decency? Where's the order? It's right here. It's in God's Word. 
But if you want to be, if, if you know, you're free to be ignorant. Do you want to be ignorant? Do you want to be a fool? Do you want to be a vessel fitted unto dishonor? Okay, then that's that's the answer. Fine. But God's way is according to order. It's not your way. Go to 1 Samuel 13. We'll end up here. It's the last thing I got. I'm almost out of time. 1 Samuel 13. I'm going to begin reading in verse, verse 1. Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, it didn't take him very long. Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the, Philist and the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people, as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Bethaven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Hard time, rough time, trial time. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. It's trial time. Samuel came not to Gilgal. The people are trembling. The people are scattered. He's losing the people. Oh, no. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Hey, buddy. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore, I got all these reasons, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Let me just say, God's just looking for a man after his own heart. All right. And that's what the whole thing's about. Here's what I want to talk about. I don't have any more notes. I'm out of I'm out of notes. But I want to say this. This has been on my mind. It's been on my heart. And it's and I and it's I enjoy preaching things that just have to be preached. And that's why I said at the beginning, if you don't feel like it's a big deal, if you don't feel like it needs to be preached, fine, fine. If you disagree with me, fine. Good men disagree with me. But let me tell you what I think I can relate this to is stepping into the realm of the Lord and taking something that you don't know you should be taking or that you know you shouldn't be taking. And what I'm talking about is leading people in prayer. And again, I've done it and good men, better men than me do it. All right. I can think of some off the top of my head. However, I don't believe in it. I think it's a very grave danger and it's been on my heart and mind. And again, this is a battle that I feel like is just it's just right in front of me. And if I don't address it, I'm a fool. If I don't address it, I'm a coward. It has to be addressed. God has given me. He's allowed me to meet some people and talk to people and learn from people and, and see things. And I'm so thankful for it. And you don't know what you don't know until you know what you didn't know. All right. And so I'm really thankful for it. And I feel like with what God's given me, I've just got to share it. I've got to. I can't not say it. And I, I believe that if you force yourself because you say it's time, you know, you say, what? I saw that the people were, it's time. You came not in the days appointed and things were gathering up. You know, the, the, it was looking rough and I just felt like it was time. You know, listen, you don't know when the time is. And here's the problem. Saul forced himself, which I didn't think he really had to force. He did what he wanted to do. That's what we learn out of Saul in his whole life all the time. And we noticed, by the way, this is not highlighted. I just noticed this just this time when I was reading this, just this time that the people were scattered from him. 
And I emphasize that when I read it, but I've never noticed that before. That's what he's worried about is the people. That's what Saul's always worried about is the people. What are the people going to think? What can I show the people? What about the people, the people, the people? Are you serving God or are you serving men? you got to decide. You can't serve God and mammon. You won't please God and man. You won't. You can't. You're not. Furthermore, more importantly, you're not. You can't say, well, yeah, God's pleased with this too. No, he's not. If God's not exclusively pleased with it, if it's not for the Lord, then it's not for God and he's not pleased with it. You say, that seems repetitive, but you better believe it is. That's right. That's the truth. You do it for God. You do it according to God's instructions. You do it decently and in order and it's for God. But we notice Saul forced himself. He did this thing. And then just as soon as he was done, it says, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. You know, what if? What if, and, and, I, and, I've, and I, this is not wrote down, I'm closing things up, I don't have any more, this is just off the top of my head. What if you go to somebody, you preach to somebody, they, you can tell, they understand it. And by the way, I've seen that. That's an awesome thing, it's a fun thing. The light bulb goes off and they get it, and they say, oh, oh, you know, whatever it is that they didn't get. And you know, oftentimes it's they see somehow... Jesus died on the cross, you know, to pay for my sins. Yeah, 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 I've heard that my whole life. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that my whole life. Well, then they realize that you owe the debt. The debt was paid, that it's legal, that it's a price, that it's there's a reason, that it's not just like, well, this is the superstitious thing God did, and this is the superstitious thing God wants you to do. No, that's not it. It's legal. It's, and when they get it, it's exciting. It's amazing. It's fun. It's the most fun thing I know is to teach somebody the most true and 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 transformative thing they'll ever learn however that's not salvation that's just getting it i've seen it and i've i've i, it, I love it it's great it's exciting but that's not salvation what if you share somebody share with somebody the gospel and they get it just like that boom light bulb you basically see the light bulb like light up over their head and you know they got it and then you say well you know do you believe this and this is how this is how i end up by the way i said do you believe these things we've talked about yeah yeah i do do you believe that if you were to call on the lord and ask him to save you do you believe he'd do it and the answer hopefully at this point is yeah yeah i do well i would say at this point that's what you need to do just give it a try that's what you need to do don't wait you can do it right now you can do it when you go inside I don't care. You don't have to do it with me. I'm not going to lead you. I'm not the Holy Spirit, but you got to do that. And that's how I'd lead them. What if you just tweak that a little bit? Now, I'm not saying somebody's preaching the gospel all wrong, but what if you just tweak? You preach the gospel just exactly the way I want it preached from A to Z. Money. Perfect. And then at the very end, you say, well, bow your head and I'll lead you in a prayer. And you lead them in a prayer and they pray the prayer and they've got it. Remember, they got it. They got it. And they pray the prayer and they understand and they believe they say and they say later, you know what they're going to say later is, you know, how I know I'm saved because I prayed a prayer and such and such time. And I just believe God's word. I've heard that so many times. That's not the worst thing a person could say. But you know how I know I'm saved because I was there when God broke me. That's how I know I'm saved. I was there when God said and he took my face and put it in the dirt, you know, not literally. But that's how I felt. I was there. And when I received that and and turned to the Lord in that affliction, saved assurance from who? From the preacher that prayed with me? No, I was at home in bed from the Holy Spirit because and this is how I know and you should know. And if you don't know, you need to get saved. But the Holy Spirit is full well able to give assurance. The Holy Spirit is full well more than you with an army. To get somebody in church, to get them baptized, to get them to call on the Lord. The Holy Spirit can do it all. Far more powerful than you could. So what if you went through all this and you led them in the prayer and you're convinced and they, you shook their hand and said, If you believe that in your heart, you're saved. I don't know your heart. But if you believe that in your heart, you're saved. And they say, I get it. I get it for the first time ever. I totally believe it. And then, as soon as they're done praying, as soon as they make an end of making this offering on your own, the Holy Spirit shows up. And says, hey, I'm here to break your heart. Hey, I'm here for you to call on the Lord. But they've already done this thing. Now, I'm being a little bit dramatic. But what if it happens in a week or a month or a year or 10 years or 20 years or way late in their life? And they think, well, I hear the conviction. I hear the still smoke. It's almost undeniable. However, I did this that time. Boy, that guy was right. I mean, I, he was a good preacher and he was stood by the truth and he was stood for all the right things. By the way, what a dangerous, 
dangerous deception when a man that stands for all the right things will give somebody assurance. I don't I can't give you any assurance. In fact, I'm getting to the point and I'm not ready to just say this, but and I'm done up here. But as I get as I grow, I'm getting to the point where I just want to preach you lost. If I can't do it, it's because you're saved. And if I can't, then you need to get saved. That's the way I feel. I don't want to give you any assurance. I feel like the best preaching that I hear is just it's trying to preach me lost. And you know what it does? It's giving me more assurance. And that's what it ought to do. So I want to preach you lost. I want to preach you lost every chance I get. That's what you ought to do. Every chance you get is preach everybody lost. You ought never tell anybody they're saved. You ought never assure them. You ought never show them. You ought never indicate because you simply don't know. There are some people I believe are saved. I mean, I'd bet my house on it, but to bet my house on it, which by the way, I live in an apartment right now, but to bet my house on it, I'd take, I'd bet the house and the neighbor's house and all, no, but to bet my house on it would be less dangerous, listen to me, than to assure them of it. All right? I don't know their heart and you don't either. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your instructions, Lord. I pray that we'd heed them. I pray that we'd hear them. I pray that we'd have ears to hear and we'd apply them to our heart and life, Lord. I pray that you bless this church, bless this time. In Jesus' name. Amen.